Federal CIOs are undertaking several new initiatives to modernize and transform their digital operations and to meet a host of new administration orders to fortify their IT security. I'm Wyatt Cash with Scoop News Group and joining us to talk about that today and specifically how the U.S. Department of Education is working towards that goal is Stephen Hernandez, Chief Information Security Officer at the Department of Education. Uh, Stephen is responsible for all facets of the $700 million IT portfolio there uh, while also serving as co-chair of the U.S. Federal Chief Information Security Officer Council at the Office of Management and Budget. He previously served for a number of years at the Department of Health and Human Services in a variety of senior IT security roles. And also joining us uh, to provide an added perspective on technology advances around data analytics and security is Bill Wright, Senior Director, North American Government Affairs for Splunk. Uh, before joining Splunk, Bill held counterterrorism advisory positions at the U.S. Department of State and the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. And he's also directed activities on behalf of the Senate Committee on Homeland Security and Government Affairs. Uh, Stephen and Bill, thank you so much for joining us and look forward to talking with you. Thanks for having us today, Wyatt. Great to be here. Thank you. So, Stephen, let's begin with you. How is the Department of Education enabling or enhancing digital transformation by accelerating the department's reliance on the cloud and, and, and using the data that it collects? You know, at the department, um, we, we were already aware of it, but now we are just absolutely um, painstakingly aware of how data is the lifeblood of our organization. Uh, most folks know us for our, our awesome mission in the education space, especially around policy. Um, and, you know, folks don't always connect the dots that, well, geez, you also have a $1.7 trillion accounts receivable and your broker maybe another couple trillion dollars every year. And in that facet, we're, we're really like a bank. And so uh, years ago, we heeded the cloud first initiative and ran with it. And as of today, we don't report any data centers in terms of government data centers, which looks great on the Fatara scorecard. What that's led us to though, is a realization that much like we went through data center consolidation at the department, we're now looking at cloud rationalization and cloud optimization. Is my data and my workload in the right cloud environment to get the results we need? And so we're spending a lot of time thinking through what we now call the cloud smart initiative about the right data, the right workload, the right cloud, the right time, and in some cases, the right price point um, as various cloud providers optimize their environments. And so when we look at this, um, it's really, uh, that's our future. And ultimately we're in about 40 give or take of the major cloud service providers now. When I think about it as a CISO, it's a lot of attack surface to cover, a lot of complexity, and we're really driving for how do we drive that down? Well, that leads to my next question, kind of more specifically to you, how is your role evolving as a CISO uh, now that uh, you and the Department of Education has moved so completely to the cloud? It's a great question. and. Um, you know, even five years ago, if you'd asked me that, um, I would probably have a very different answer than today because there's a difference of having the servers in your data center and, and you have the full stack, all seven layers of the technology stack at your disposal and your ability to influence. Going to the cloud, and I think Bruce Schneier said it the best, there's an element of trusting your cloud feudal overlord that they're doing the right things too. And so what that's done in the cybersecurity space is it's transformed us in terms of we still have to know all the cybersecurity goodies, you know, the risk management, the vulnerability space, zero trust, all these different facets. But now we also have to understand the contractual elements, partner programs, vitally important to us like FedRAMP, and then how we bring all those pieces together. So it's really become an incredible team sport now, where if we're not able to work with our vendor community, work with our partners like FedRAMP, while still maintaining this idea of 
of driving visibility throughout, in many cases, a diverse cloud portfolio, um, it's really easy to get behind. And I think that last part about how do we get parity and risk visibility through that cloud environment, that's where that the notion around optimization, that's a big discussion point there. Am I partnering with providers in the cloud space and competing providers and getting providers to win those competitions that are then also going to benefit me from the security perspective? Mm, makes a lot of sense. And it sounds like a big challenge as well. Well, Bill, let me bring you in at this point. Um, you have kind of an interesting view of the broader federal market. Tell me a little about how you're seeing federal agencies using data uh, and the cloud to enhance digital transformation. Yeah, first off, I'm glad to hear Stephen say that's a uh, team sport. I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, obviously we're in the, the midst of a, a massive digital transformation all the way across the federal space, not just at education. Um, you know, perhaps more change in the last 10 months than the prior 10 years combined. Um, this had already begun prior to the pandemic, uh, but there's little doubt that it certainly accelerated the process. And I think there are a couple, um, couple things driving this. And I think first and foremost, our citizen expectations. You know, people expect a seamless digital experience from their government. Um, cloud technologies are both increasingly vital, but they're also becoming increasingly complex. And COVID-19 just uh, threw that all into overdrive. Uh, the pandemic and the global shutdowns that followed made most government services even more critical, um, while also challenging organizations' uh, ability to deliver on those services. So. Agencies had to really accelerate this transformation to continue to deliver on their mission. Um, in some ways, I think this last year has been a, a, a real world proof of concept. Uh, the cloud and other modernization strategies are, are now mission critical priority. Today, nearly every interaction between citizens and government employees has some level of, uh, of, of digital connection, registering your vehicle, filing for veterans claims. So, um, all increasingly digital, and to paraphrase our former uh, U.S. CIO Suzette Kent, you know those agencies, such as the Department of Education, that have invested in modern technology, specifically cloud and shared services, um, it's allowed them to be more nimble during this pandemic, allowed them to pivot and scale, uh, making them more resilient organizations. And at the heart of this transformation um, and every modernization effort is data, as Stephen said, the lifeblood, uh, the ability to understand that data and the ability to act on that data. Well, Stephen, doubling back to you and the topic of cybersecurity, uh, how has your security strategy changed in terms of the tools and the processes uh, as the Department of Education continues to evolve towards this uh, complex multi-cloud environment? Well, you know, it seems like we, we can't have a conversation around cybersecurity in the federal space without mentioning one, the pandemic, uh, and then two, the cybersecurity executive order. And, and now we also have uh, an, an added amplifier here in terms of the president's management agenda, also recently published. And I think when we look at all of this coming together, uh, I think the pandemic really drove a challenge to say, can we work in ways, and frankly, can we construct security architecture uh, to support, for example, a 100% remote workforce? And the resounding answer is, yes, we can. Um, we take that same type of innovation and mindset and we bring it into, for example, the executive order. This executive order is like nothing I've seen in the past decade. It is amongst the most comprehensive and ambitious executive orders around cybersecurity uh, that I think the federal Federal space is embraced. And with it, now we have the president's management agenda that's challenging us to use IT strategically, use data strategically across the enterprise. And if at, if at any point in the past, security was somewhat isolated in its own little realm, uh, that's changing and rapidly. And when you put it all together, it's really doubling down on things like FATARA and these um, laws that are on the books to really advance information technology writ large including security. Something I wanna to touch on in that partner space, especially with the executive order, is CISA, our Cybersecurity Infrastructure and Security Agency. They're working with us shoulder to shoulder in, in several different areas, but the big ones for us, and as we're looking at the executive order, certainly around things like supply chain, around things like 
high value assets and around things like uh, even uh, shared services around say security operations and how can we get the best communication and information sharing through a partner like CISA. And then some of the larger, more technical and tools part of the executive order, we're seeing in some of those subsequent management memos from OMB and also some of the binding operational directives. Big emphasis on zero trust, huge emphasis on software assurance, both pedigree, where is the software coming from, how is it built, and the vulnerabilities that are in that software. We just had a binding operational directive around that. And then finally, um, the, the bell of the ball, really zero trust architectures and how we're going to bring all this advanced thinking and advanced technology into the operational state and make it a reality. A lot of mandates and guidelines to follow there uh, and uh, all for the good, it sounds like. Um, lastly, gentlemen, um, you know, kind of looking ahead over the next 12 to 18 months, what, what do you see as the top security priorities, given that you have so many, uh, when it comes specifically to uh, making use of the cloud? Uh, Stephen, maybe we'll start with you and, and wrap up with Bill. Yeah, so uh, for us, that, that data piece is, is going to be huge. Um, one of those memorandums which folds into the discussion around zero trust uh, is really around the idea of, of some pretty robust logging capabilities where it comes to our systems. Uh, and for us, when we look across our cloud portfolio, it's been fascinating to see some of our providers, they're already there. It's simply a matter of, of tapping into it and getting access to the data. Others, it might be a little more challenging. And in, in, in that space, especially where we have service providers that might be a little closer to software as a service, we're going to have to work really close to their agenda and their roadmap to make sure that they understand in nine months, we need to be able to have this type of logging information. And that's a different conversation because that's typically happening around the software development level versus more of the platform and the infrastructure. And then all that to say, if we look at what OMB is asking us to do, it's about getting all that information in a centralized view. In some cases that could be the same data lake, could be the same uh, data warehouse, depending on technologies, or in some cases, multiple and then having the ability to get access to all of them so you can compare notes. Do I have someone trying to move laterally through my different cloud environments to get a foothold and eventually escalate? I'd say the second priority is for us is definitely around that zero trust architecture. And for us, as we're starting down the path, we already have a data lake, um, fantastic investment we made a few years back and we continue to mature it. We've got a great centralized identity program. And so for us on the journey, we're really focused on right now, what we call secure access service edge or SASE, that's a, a Gartner term that really provides the foundational pieces of a control fabric in the zero trust architecture that's gonna allow us to implement near real time granular control based on endpoints and then continuously authenticate that relationship with endpoints, devices, users, and whatever resource they're trying to get to. Uh, part of that is also gonna be some advancements in our uh, security operations center, bringing in some technologies around security orchestration, automation, and response. Now that we have all this rich data, we have it available for us in the data lake, let's start having the machines make some decisions at the speed of the electrons to keep ahead of the bad folks. Well, Stephen, thank you for sharing some of your vision there. And uh, um, I'm interested to hear from Bill as well. Bill, what are, you, what are you foreseeing in the way of the, really the top priorities or issues that federal CIOs are likely to be contending with over the next 12 to 18 months? Yeah, so all, always dangerous to uh, try to predict uh, what's coming down the road, especially with such a fast evolving uh, cyber landscape. But and what we're hearing a lot from our uh, federal customers is, um, you know, how do we comply with some of these new mandates discussed in the cyber EO and where are those resources coming from? Um, you know, I know as a close partner and vendor, we're certainly doing our part to comply with the, the sections of the EO that apply to us, you know, think uh, secure software. Um, and I would foot stomp uh, what, what Steve mentioned. One area that you know, we're asked about quite a bit is this section eight of the EO, which describes the new security logging standards and then codified and detailed further in the OMB memo 2131. You know, as the logging solution to most of the federal government agencies today, we're, we're uniquely positioned to really help our partners out here. You know, on a very high level, 
The guidelines set deadlines for achieving progressive levels of logging standards, each level becoming increase, increasingly sophisticated, requiring more data sources, longer retention, uh, eventually implementing uh, uh, security orchestration and automation capabilities. So to this end, we're working really closely with our government partners to try to help manage that new logging maturity model. And then another point that Steve made that I'd like to, to uh, um, underscore is we're hearing a lot about our um, um, the, uh, the priority around security automation. Federal agencies are, are looking at automation tools, um, deploy, employing machine learning to enhance their current cybersecurity efforts. There's tremendous competition for technical skills in cybersecurity. And um, this shortage, I think, is especially acute in the government where it's competing with the private sector. Uh, through security automation, these agencies can have technology do these lower level operations, maybe these routine security work, and allow experienced cybersecurity professionals that they have to focus on the more sophisticated threats. So finding ways to augment the cyber skills gap will be a priority uh, for the years to come. Thanks, Wyatt. Absolutely. Well, Stephen Hernandez and Bill Wright, thanks uh, so much for joining us today and really sharing your insights and observations around digital transformation, uh, data and security in government. Thanks for having us. Thank you, Wyatt.